It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. Many of you recognize this quotation, of course, as it's one of the most famous excerpts from a well-known author in terms of his most famous book or novel. However, Charles Dickens did not possess a monopoly on the concept of best and worst, although from the material perspective, it was certainly in effect at his time. You could argue that the same is true today, but I'm not very concerned about that. I'm concerned about it, but in a different way. I wrote upon this dichotomy in my 2009 book entitled Beyond Institutional Gurus, Initiations, and Party Men, and I wrote about it in both the introduction as well as on the back cover. Here is one of those excerpts, quote, We are in the golden age, but you cannot readily discern that from any obvious indications at the present moment. The inability to recognize it is because we are in a juxtaposition where access to the knowledge of Krishna has expanded exponentially, while that of the perverted reflections of what are wrongly alleged to be Krishna's movement have also advanced. Those deviations, in concert with Western culture, are covering genuine transcendence quite effectively at this time." Unquote. You can take advantage of spiritual life much more instantly, immediately, than at any time before in recorded history. There are many reasons for this, and most of you already are aware of those reasons. In point of fact, you're taking advantage of one of them at this very moment. At the same time, if you do not possess deep-rooted realizations combined with good association, and we offer you that association in our articles, videos, and podcasts. If you do not possess these realizations, the facts and the truths of what has gone down and what is going down in the Hare Krishna movement, then everything is as clear as mud. Everything is very mixed up now, compromised and perverted, including the narrative history of Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Krishna consciousness movement. This terrible result is due to many factors, but three of them, as indicated in the headline, are in particular going to be discussed in this month's audio podcast that you are now listening to. Those three are Hinduism, Sahajiaism, and institutionalism. The latter targets the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation. Now, the text wall for this month's transcript presentation will be different from previous ones instead of within the text of the transcription, where we usually in the past, always actually, have given the citation details of what has just been quoted, we're going to employ endnotes for the first time starting now. In other words, the sources will not be verbalized, although air quotes will indicate that this is an excerpt or a quotation. 
As such, if you want to know where the excerpt has been culled from, no problem. Consult the text wall, find the number at the end of the excerpt of your interest, and then proceed to the end of the article, which we'll have in concluded in the audio version, as always, at Sud Ava Salmia. You will in that way be given the citation source to your satisfaction. In today's postmodern, convoluted environment of pseudo-spiritual and pseudo-devotional cults, the spread and proliferation of matter disguised as spirit can be very bewildering. If you are a progressive transcendentalist, you desire to get free from all of this confusion. Today's presentation is meant for your edification and realization. It is meant to help you transcend the traps intrinsic to this puzzling situation. Some questions. What is Hinduism? What is it based upon? Does genuine Krishna consciousness actually have a place and a status in Hinduism? These questions, and many more related to them, will be answered in this podcast. Our presentations, whether written, oral, or video, are as it is and as you like it. The you being referred to here is the spirit spark of the absolute, which you are, in an, inter- in an, in an eternal personal relationship to the Supreme Person who is the controller of all things at all times and all places. As such, we are all equal on the transcendental plane, the plane of spirit spark. But otherwise, we're all very unequal. Yet my presentations are based upon the presumption of your sincerity and seriousness in spiritual life. As such, I treat you as equal to me. I do not, therefore, dumb down my presentations. Yes, this may mean that you have to approach what I produce with some basic knowledge of transcendence, but most of my viewers, listeners, and readers meet that criteria. You can also consider yourself transcendentally lucky by coming to this presentation, as it is meant for your eternal advantage, and as far as that goes, it will often help you to some extent on planes and levels below that which is transcendental to the Mahat Tattva. There must be a consideration of the Sahajya. Hinduism, when it is favorable to so-called Vaishnavism, accelerates the manifestation of Sahajism. Virtually all of you know something about Hinduism, obviously, but this topic will be presented in with more detail in future inspirationals, and your knowledge of it should thus expand. You can say that Hinduism is polytheistic, and that's not false. However, in terms of how it is practiced, One deity is always selected by the Hindu. As such, it is more henotheistic than polytheistic. When Vaishnavism degrades, it indirectly enters into the realm of Hinduism, although this is a bit difficult to realize. Not all of you, although likely most of you, have heard the term sahajya. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada introduced a new term, a conglomerate term, and it is reproduced at the very end of this excerpt, quote, The regulative principles are a device how to overcome the influence of maya and how to come to the platform of spontaneous love of Krishna. If we want to exist as first-class men in society, All our students must be induced to follow the regulative principles. One shouldn't think artificially he has come to the spontaneous platform. 
That is Sahajiaism, unquote. The new term referred to here is Sahajiaism. This term will be used repeatedly throughout our presentation, and as you may have noticed, it was also incorporated into the headline of this podcast. We're going to be discussing Sahajiaism, but only as it pertains to the branch of Vaishnavism founded by the aforementioned founder Acharya. That branch of the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya was known as the Hare Krishna movement in the West. In terms of an incorporation document created in the 60s, that entity is known as ISKCON. You may have noticed that this acronym, it is an acronym of a corporate name, in other words, the full name is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. This acronym, acronym has quotation marks on each side of it in the headline. And finally, there's you. Where you are situated internally determines to what degree you can gain and glean benefit from this presentation. Such is the case with anything you read or watch, of course. Where's your mind at? Do you know how to differentiate intelligence from mind? Do you know what ahankara means and how it relates to your conditioned life in the cycle of birth and death? Do you know where you are at on the causal plane and how that relates to your astral body, which consists of the just mentioned elements of manas, buddhi, and ahankara? The process of spiritual life runs on two tracks. One can be considered positive and one can be superficially considered negative. I personally am named after the Supreme Personality of Servitor Godhead. Some fanatical so-called Christians consider him to be Satan. Although Lord Shiva is the controller from the causal plane of the satanic energy, he has another feature, a transcendental feature, that is more important, quote, he is the greatest of all Vaishnavas, the greatest of all devotees. Vaishnavanam yata Shambhu. Shambhu, or Lord Shiva, is the ideal Vaishnava. He constantly meditates upon Lord Rama and chants Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Shiva has a Vaishnava Sampradaya, which is called the Vishnu Swami Sampradaya, unquote. One feature of Lord Shiva is superficially quite negative, but he has this transcendental side to him as well. In other words, quote, Lord Shiva takes charge of reforming persons who are ghosts and demons, not to speak of others who are godly. Therefore, he is the spiritual master of everyone, both the dull and the demoniac and the highly learned Vaishnavas. It is also stated, Vaishnavanam yata shampu. Shampu, Lord Shiva, is the greatest of all Vaishnavas. On one hand, he is the worshipable object of the dull demons, and on the other, he is the best of all Vaishnavas or devotees, and he has a sampradaya called the Rudra Sampradaya. Unquote. How is this knowledge to be applied? There are many applications. But the one I'm pointing out here is that the train runs on two tracks. You have to be able to know, realize, and overcome the negative in order to take advantage of the transcendentally positive. Vidyang cha vidyang chayas tad vedopayang saha avidyaya amrit yung thirtva vidyaya amritam ashnute. One who is simultaneously knows both the vidya and the avidya, transcending death by culture of knowledge of nations, enjoys immortality. That's from the Isha Upanishad, of course. 
Only one who is willing to cultivate knowledge on both sides of the tracks can transcend the cycle of birth and death. As such, pointing out how nescience works in Hinduism, pointing out how it is working in Sahajaism, and pointing out how it is all-pervading in so-called ISKCON is only superficially unpleasant, but it's very necessary. It must be done. Abhipigachet. Those who work under the spiritual influence of Lord Shiva as the greatest Vaishnav are able to do it and must do it. We are all transmitters of cosmic forces from different parts of this universe. We are all responsible for our influence. If you are transmitting hellish vibes, you are a conductor from a principality located in Narakaloka. However, everything allegedly negative that is transmitted by an individual is not necessarily coming from the lower regions. Indeed, it may be coming from transcendental forces and powers. You have to be able to discriminate. And this word discriminate is not a bad word. Transmitting the negative in order to overcome its connection to the pathological mode of ignorance, showing that for what it is and what that results in is integral to buddhi yoga. Get used to this if you want to take advantage of devotees who are beyond institutional influence. The same applies to taking advantage of Prabhupada's presentations and purports. Prabhupada could be, and indeed he was, superficially negative in much of his speech and writing. Please note that the no negativity demand of the sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows crowd consists, objectively speaking, of a negative noun and a negative adjective. In no yoga system, in no genuine yoga system, can, negative, can negativity be avoided. Rules and regulations in spiritual life automatically entail restriction, which is integral to negativity, at least in most cases. Of course, if the rules and regulations are bona fide, they're not coming from, nor do they lead to, hellish regions. Indeed, in point of fact, they are coming from and produce just the opposite place and the opposite result. As such, revealing Hinduism for what it is, even if that appears to be somewhat negative, read superficially negative, it is integral to the process of transcending Hinduism. Similarly, Sahajaism. Similarly, so-called Iskand. And just as importantly, similarly, the fruit of being. The fruit of being of you, which is false ego, a hankar, constantly trying to convince you that that fruit of being is your actual self. So first, let's consider Hinduism. It's a word derived from Islamic influences. Now, one factor here to consider. Names of places and things often get dumbed down over time. Here's one example of that. We could give hundreds. There's an important city in Uttar Pradesh known as Varanasi, but it's more often referred to as Banaras. This obviously is a dumbed down or vulgar version of the four-syllable proper name of that sacred city, dumbed down to the three-syllable three version. Kali Yuga is always about such degradation. There's the Indus River in far northern India. On the northern side of that river, the people are mostly Muslim or Islamic. South of that river, the people are mostly Vedic or Vedic to some extent. The Muslims thus demarcated those on the south side as Hindus by adding the aspirate to the beginning of the word Indus for the Indus River. 
from one perspective, this is a recent development, but in terms of civilizations in Kali Yuga, this is a tag or a name from antiquity. In essence, Hinduism is a third order simulacrum of strict Shankara Mayavad. It's also a conglomerate of many different cults, factions, and belief systems that have their origins in the subcontinent. The Mayavad element is present in it to a significant extent, and many Hindus would consider the major Mayavad centers in the four corners of India not just as part of Hinduism, but integral to it. However, all Hindus would consider the Vedas as revelation intrinsic to Hinduism. Such is ultimately the case. Most Hindus would emphasize the root value of Vedic literature and the processes inculcated in them. This would include the 20 Dharma Shastras, although how many of these lines are still extant is hard to quantify. It could be that none of them are. This is because the Vedic literature is complex and painstaking. It is ultra-extensive, and its demands for regulative activity are very strict in almost all cases. Hinduism itself, with some rare exceptions, is not like that, nor are its teachings. Only superficially is it in accord with the Vedic revelation. This is particularly the case as far as the Vaishnav faith is concerned, which is accurately promulgated by a close and strict reading of the Vedic literatures as the cream of the Vedas. According to calculation and interpretation, and that is what we should be most interested in, Vaishnavism is certainly part of the Vedic revelation, but it is not actually part of Hinduism. Only some Hindus acknowledge and realize this. Jainism and Buddhism have no connection whatsoever to Hinduism for many reasons. They're voidists. Whereas Hinduism believes in the Supreme Brahman, also known as Brahman Nirvana, beyond the void of Nirvana. Buddhists do not accept the existence of the Atma or eternal spirit self, whereas its eternal existence is essential to Hinduism. The Buddhist and Jain lines do not at all acknowledge what to speak of depend upon the Vedic literature. Indeed, one of the chief Buddhist tenets postulates that the writers of the Vedic literature were all conditioned souls, mundane men, who could not produce anything whatsoever transcendental. Now, let's consider the three Abrahamic religions. These three Abrahamic religions are also not included as being part of Hinduism. The Hindus, with a very few handful of exceptions, put great emphasis on deity worship. This is condemned, violently condemned, by one of the Abrahamic religions in particular, and the other two do not engage in it. They have icons or statues, but not deity worship. In other words, their statues do not entail formal deity worship. Christianity rightly sees itself as different from Hinduism, and hardly anyone would dispute this. The belief in reincarnation and samsara is integral to Hinduism, but the monotheism of Christianity postulates only one human lifetime, followed by either heaven or hell, or limbo in some cases. Worship of Lord Vishnu as the supreme controller, or Parameshvara, is known as Vaishnavism. This is not at all the same as Hinduism. There is an essential difference. Versions of a loose concept of Vaishnavism fit into the Hindu pantheon, but that's not actual Vaishnavism. Actual Vaishnavism, genuine Vaishnavism, is separate from Hinduism, as are 
the monotheistic religions of the Abrahamic variety, along with Buddhism, Jainism, Shinto, and animism. Sometimes Hinduism is considered pantheistic, but that's not really the case. Despite its all-inclusiveness with cults that emphasize deity worship, the exception to that all-inclusiveness being, as just mentioned, Vaishnavism, Hinduism is essentially henotheistic. You may wrongly conclude that Vaishnavism is monotheistic, most definitely that it's a misconception, but Vaishnavism is not henotheistic either. Vaishnavism is linked to the universal and transcendental realities of the absolute philosophy, which encompasses both its ontological and even its etymological substance is absolute. When that appears not to be the case, as in anything connected to the temporary material universe, those truths, those relative truths, are integrated in the right way with the absolute eternal truth of Vaishnavism. As such, to claim that Vaishnavism is simply another interesting theological philosophy is entirely a misguided concept. Vaishnavism is the culmination of all philosophy, all genuine philosophy. It is the culmination of all revealed text. Most importantly, it can be known through revelation, although, as aforementioned, logic and intelligent philosophy can be helpful in the beginning stages. Vaishnavism is panentheistic. It is not pantheistic. It does not wrongly claim that everything is God or that the universe is God. These are major misconceptions, and genuine Vaishnava philosophy rejects them. Although in the very beginning of spiritual life, and most of you should be beyond that now, these concepts can be temporarily helpful as stepping stones. Similarly, genuine revealed text completely rejects henotheism, although superficially at least, it appears to be a match with Hinduism's various emphases on henotheism. Panentheism means that the demigods, and there are 33 million of them in a hierarchy of delegated powers, are all godly. They are thus like the supreme god, but ultimately only to a limited extent, especially the lower demigods. Henotheism expounds something very different from that. It does not recognize Parameshwar. Although Lord Vishnu is sometimes described as the demigod, Deva Deva or the chief demigod, he is not ultimately that, despite controlling one of the primary modes, the Sattva Guna. He controls the mode of goodness. Simultaneously, he is also the Parameshwar, or the Supreme Personality and Controller of all the other demigods, all of them. That's different from henotheism. The term panentheism contains this absolute and perfect concept. Lord Vishnu is within everything and controls everything, but he is not himself everything because everything is also different from him. As such, Despite all the deity worship that pervades Hinduism, the pantheism and henotheism within it must be overcome. It must be overcome if you want actual spiritual realizations. Those concepts of pantheism and henotheism are wrong, and anything espousing them is called mistaken knowledge. Tatvamasi. Panentheism is the right philosophy and the right way to understand the ontological existence of all that is. This right, perfect Vaishnava philosophy also incorporates the absolute concept of Parinamavad, which opposes the Vivartavad of Mayavad philosophy, and as I've already mentioned, Mayavad philosophy pervades all of Hinduism. As such, the conclusion must be that Vaishnavism is not the same as Hinduism, and that means that Vaishnavas are not 
Hindus. The demarcation between these two is just as immovable as the demarcation between Vaishnavas and Christians, Vaishnavas and Buddhists, Vaishnavas and Talmudists, what to speak of Vaishnav and Islamicists, the latter being extremely inimical to both Hindus and Vaishnavas, especially due to the deity worship that is integral to both of those. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada was not very favorable to Hinduism. Here are five of many more quotes he either spoke or wrote about in terms of his view of Hinduism. Quote, So far my writings are concerned, avoid publishing them in hodgepodge journals. These so-called Hindus are generally impersonalists and we do not want to have anything to do with them. Unquote. Quote, My Guru Maharaj every step condemned this Ramakrishna mission and Vivekananda. He said frankly that if there are any impediments for our movement, he said frankly hodgepodge, Gandhi's also hodgepodge. He was a politician, and in politics he mixed some spiritual ideas hodgepodge, and this Vivekananda was also a politician, unquote. Quote, regarding the Hindu community, don't expect anything very wonderful from them. You cannot expect any cultural contribution. So you will tactfully deal with them, and whenever possible, vehemently protest against their foolish ideas. Best thing will be to avoid them as far as possible. I am concerned to preach this gospel amongst the Europeans and Americans, and am not at all interested to preach amongst the Indians, because they have now become hodgepodge due to so many years of subjugation by foreigners and having lost their own culture, unquote. And by that he's referring to Vedic culture, genuine Vedic culture. Quote, regarding the Hindu centers in the foreign countries, none of them are bona fide. There is a similar hodgepodge center in London. Actually, Hindus and non-Hindus, everyone is at the present moment out of touch of the real science of spiritual knowledge. Everyone is going under some religious badge only. So it is very difficult to deal with them unless they're very much serious to understand the science of God, unquote. Quote, other than the bona fide Vaishnav functions, we cannot divert our devotees' attention to such participation in so-called religious functions. This has spoiled Hindu religion into a hodgepodge of pseudo-religion, unquote. If you claim to be a devotee in Prabhupada's branch of the Gaudiya Sampradaya, do you really need anything more than these five summary quotations? His divine grace never wanted his men to consider themselves Hindus, nor did he ever encourage any Hindu line, any Hindu center, or any Hindu publication. This fact was lost in the fog of inter Nicene War, particularly in the 90s, when the second transformation of so-called ISKCON was floundering financially and was thus forced to rely upon Hindu revenue for its sustenance and to keep from cratering. The Hindu hodgepodge, as we pointed out repeatedly in past articles, past videos, and audio podcasts, constitutes the third transformation in the degradation of descending octaves that has been and continues to be so-called ISKCON since the zonal acharyas were imposed upon everyone. Those 11 rascals were all sahajas. There are 13 classic sahaja groups as given to us by Bhaktivinoda Thakur through the pure agency of Prabhupada. Quote, so, there are 13 pseudo-pretenders belonging to the Chaitanya Sampradaya. They are called first Aul, 
Baum, Kartavaja, Neda, Darvish, Sani, Sukhipeki, Garanga Nagari, Chudathari, Utivadi, and Smarta, Jatakosani, like that, 13. If I describe these 13, it would take many hours. As such, I don't describe them here. But three must be briefly mentioned. They are italicized in the bold in the excerpt in the text wall. How that ties into the theme of this presentation requires a prequel, and that prequel will center upon the hippie religion of the 60s and some of the early 70s. The most important Sahajya movement is Jata Gosani, but it cannot be expected that the classic version of this is operative at this time. It's current in both so-called Iskand and Neomat, although during the Zonal Acharya epoch, Daravesh was more prevalent than Jata Gosani. As far as Ritvik is concerned, it's linked to Karta Bhaja. Ritvik is Neo Karta Bhaja. But this discussion of these comparative religions, deviations, all of them, merits a separate podcast to explore the whole thing threadbare. There are preliminaries about Sahajism that all the listeners and readers must first know, and then we'll dig more deeply into this upper Sampadaya and how so-called Iskan is particularly linked to it. However, for now, let us consider the hippies. This will tie into the overall theme. His divine grace spoke about them quite a bit. He had a lot of dealings with them, as history proves. Prabhupada recruited most of his early leaders of his ISKCON movement from the hippie class. Quote, Actually, the hippies are our best customers. Almost all of our important disciples are recruited from that group, and you are also from that group. Unquote. In two letters to his disciples, Prabhupada specifically called the hippies his best clients. He also considered them immediate candidates for Krishna consciousness. He said that there is, quote, great potency of recruiting Krishna consciousness devotees from them, unquote. He said that they were frustrated and wanted something sublime. He even went so far as to provisionally infer that their philosophy is nice, quote, of course, the hippie philosophy is nice in the sense that they have been disgusted with the materialistic way of life, therefore they want to renounce this stereotyped way of life, unquote. He believed that most hippies were after peace of mind. This is known as Atmarama in Sanskrit, although few, if any, hippies use that term. He also acknowledged that hippies wanted to transcend matter and that their indulgence in drugs was mostly for that purpose. Quote, there are some movements like the Beatles or hippies among the younger generation by realizing the, the negation of matter. Their attempt is to forget matter by some hallucination or mental concoction with the help of some deluding matter. So their attempt is nice, but there is no guide, unquote. Yes, as he clearly states here, the hippies had no guide. He was willing to be their guide. He wanted, him, they, he wanted them to accept him as their leader, and some of them did, of course. He even went so far as to say, actually, quote, actually, all of these hippies should join us, unquote. He added this as well, quote, I wish that the whole group known as the hippies may take advantage of this movement and make their life very successful, unquote. These are the positives about the hippies. Only some of the hippies, of course. And their relationship to Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement specifically and the Chaitanya Sampradaya generally. These positives are significant. At the same time, Prabhupada made many statements about the hippies that were either quite negative or exceedingly negative. This side of the coin is also to be investigated. Quote, what is this road show and yoga village? It will be another hippie edition. 
Gradually, the Krishna consciousness idea will evaporate. Another change. Another change. Every day, another change. Stop all this. Simply have kirtan, nothing else. Don't manufacture ideas, unquote. This excerpt is particularly poignant because that so-called road show was all about enjoying, entertaining, and via the musical concoctions that it meant to attract the mundane mind with. It was loaded with concoctions and led by a devotee who was very emotional and demonstrative, not necessarily charismatic, and certainly not very intelligent. He was an active homosexual even after initiation from Prabhupada, and he died early from AIDS. Notice how Prabhupada throws shade on the hippies into the mix. In other words, this particular leader, and yes, he came to Prabhupada from the hippie community in the early years, was displaying latent hippie tendencies in his traveling road show. It is important to know that Prabhupada did not consider the hippies to be very intelligent. He also believed them not to be interested in spiritual science. They were, or many of them, advancing a philosophy of mediocre substance, and he compared their ideas to communism, which Prabhupada abhorred. Sometimes Prabhupada would specifically differentiate them from college students in general, what to speak of the intelligent class of men he was trying to recruit and convert to Krishna consciousness. Quote, The future of the Western world is very dark. By such unrestricted association of young boys and girls, it's gradually turning them to be victims of the hippie and communist philosophy. So far I have considered it is very difficult to turn the people's face towards spiritual advancement, unquote. We shall spend more time discussing this factor in the presentation, but he also considered the hippies to be following a concocted religion. Quote, regarding the hippie religion, we must distinguish ourselves from them, from the hippies, unquote. On the other hand, Prabhupada believed that in some Western universities, the entire student body had become converted into hippies. He acknowledged that most of, if not all of them, were feeling very keenly the frustration of material life. He instructed his disciples to recruit them as a duty. He instructed his disciples to have a feeling very sympathetic for them and with them. He wanted his disciples to bring them to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada knew that this could make those hippies perfect in due course, which was the most essential part of his mission to the West. It, would, it could be considered, his movement could be considered really successful only if he created a perfect disciple. The perfection of man was the essence of his Krishna consciousness movement. That is what he deemed necessary to make his movement actually successful. Yet he also considered hippies to be very degraded and some of them even diabolical due to demoniac association. He actually considered them or some of them to be, quote, a great danger, unquote, to civilization in general. He considered some of them to be, to some extent, or to a very significant extent, under the influence of witches and warlocks. Quote, this is going on. For want of bathing, the population of this age will appear like pishachas or hippies. Everything is given in the Vedas exactly, unquote. Quote, the hippies are not bad souls because soul is part and parcel of Krishna. So, in fact, everyone is good, because everyone is spirit soul. But by demoniac association, they have been misled, unquote. Quote, I have requested him to help this movement, and that help will save your country from great danger by turning hippies into happies, unquote. Pishacha Loka 
is the planet of witches and warlocks, loaded with pathological principalities, obviously. These are all very powerful principalities. And unlike the Svargaloka, Pishachaloka is located very close to Earth, close from that perspective, which I've just given. During the hippie epoch, Pishachaloka had not total influence on the Earth, but it had increased and significant influence. Such a hippie religion would certainly be influenced by not only that element, but a bit later, also by an upper sampradaya of the Sahajya variety. This is the essence of what we are explaining here. The ISKCON movement was supposed to be about education and spiritual science in order to turn hippies, or those who came who were not hippies, which was the minority report, to turn them into self-realized acharyas, perfect men. However, it did not work out. It turned out just to be the opposite. The zonal takeover was engineered in a kind of corporate smash and grab by 11 sahajias, all of whom were former hippies. They proved to be imitators and pretenders, but they used many subtle means to implement their imposition. Those subtle Machiavellian tactics were easy and natural for them to employ because everyone in the movement was under their thumb. Although one or two of them appeared to be intelligent, they were not truly learned men in spiritual science. They were not spiritual masters, but they were masters in cult manipulation in which they had many years of training. They did not train the devotees under them in spiritual science to become true acharyas. Instead, they trained those people under them to, in effect, be lapdogs, sycophants, enforcers, and chelas. These bad leaders were, and some of them still are, a great danger to the spiritual and devotional movement, which they have now murdered through not only their imposition, but the transformations they seeded after their sway over the majority of the devotees was finally broken in the mid-80s, broken to some extent. All of this went down because their real faces were covered for many years until the opportunity for them to complete the takeover finally presented itself. And man, did they jump on it. Now, we're at the fag end of the third transformation right now. However, in one sense, so-called ISKCON is actually a Hindu movement. This may seem contradictory, but it's really not. When Sahajas degrade a genuine spiritual movement into something else, that new manifestation fits right in with Hinduism, almost seamlessly. Why did those former, question mark, hippies degrade so easily into Sahajism? We get a strong hint from his divine grace as to the reason, quote, But one thing is, we are observing here in Europe, many, many hippies have become so disgusted with material life that they are also now so much degraded that they will not hear our philosophy, they're simply mocking it. So our devotees become very much learned, they must become very much learned to remove the doubts, and they must become very much fixed up in Krishna consciousness. But so far preaching to the general public, especially the hippie class, it is better not to preach very much philosophy, unquote. Krishna consciousness is all about Buddha yoga and absolute philosophy. The hippies of the 60s and the first half of the 70s were, with few exceptions, not learned people. They had lost all interest in compulsory education. They had willingly become degraded and were, again, with a handful of exceptions, simply interested to enjoy life in a kind of nihilistic, absurdist, and hedonistic fashion. They complemented that mentality with the rock message music, 
which indicated that they were after real knowledge and the removal of contradictions, but only up to a point. That applied to most of them, but there was a constituted minority. Those are the genuine devotees of today. The colossal hoax known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation is a pseudo-spiritual scam. It was and is the mothership of all deviations that ensued after it and in no small part because of it. The 11 great pretender Mahabharats were all former hippies with their ability to dominate the governing body and impose a completely new and unauthorized system of so-called devotional service in the name of the founder Acharya and his, in his institution. They did just that. They gave, this gave them, this domination gave them unprecedented, massive, short-term enjoyment, but at the cost of murdering the movement. It was Sahajism, and it led to further Sahajism. The Zonal Acharya Sahajism proliferated to two other Sahaja movements that are unacceptable to the real Guru Parampara. That real Guru Parampara, that branch of the Chaitanya tree, is what Prabhupada perfectly represented. However, now we experience the worst of times due to all of this flotsam of Hinduism and Sahajism coming back to us from the back of the stone boat of so-called ISKCON. Sadeva Samya, 